Welcome back to the Quiet On Said podcast. I'm Jung Gruff, and as always, I'm joined by Lachlan Teeley. On episode 203, I'm still trying to figure out, Ewan, are we a news podcast or a movie podcast? Because, my God, there's a lot of trailers, a lot of news. This industry is busy. Uh, not all of it's great news, but some of it is also uh, just, holy fuck, how is this happening so quickly news? But we'll get into that very shortly. Yeah, then I had some time to uh, catch up on some films that I really wanted to see, like the Oscar contender Sing Sing. I also watched the classic Rosemary's Baby in, a, in preparation for Apartment 9A and The Perfect Couple, which, not to get ahead of myself here too much, but it's like a sad excuse of The White Lotus for Netflix. And Lachlan watched Bram Stoker's Dracula. Finally, Francis Ford Coppola's latest film, Ooh. Megalopolis, has finally released Metropolis. down here in Australia. Ewan saw yeah. it a few months ago whilst he was in Cannes. And well, I think you said you loved it. I think it was just your favorite movie <laughs> of the festival. Uh, yeah. I have remained extremely optimistic about the film after having... A uh, massively, like hugely divisive uh, opinions on online, especially on Letterbox. It has got this crazy, uh, like I think there was a, a thing going around social media the day of like literally the reviews being like up down up down up down up down for mm. Megalopolis. I, I finally caught it, and I honestly have to say I am super excited about this episode. Ah uh, yes, it's been one that we've been talking about since May. You know, since the end of May when I came back is like yeah. We really hope we have different opinion on this. I feel like it doesn't even matter if we more align. There's so much to talk about this and why it's not working. Maybe where Lachlan thinks it is working because I feel like it's working nowhere. Uh, but all of that later on in a full-on spoiler review for Megalopolis. But uh, let's get into the show. We are professionals. This is, this is a professional podcast. Yes. Breaking bad and better for song. Hello there. <laughs> Which actually, Did you this get is going to be a as bit, well? Um, yes. So I've got Dune Cam. It's just a camera <laughs> with my Dune steelbook. We're back and we're not doing, you know, the news because we're like, hey, not film news. Let's talk about something that is in the gaming world with Sony's showcase that they had. Uh, and they showed a sequel to a game that is getting a... Is it, is it a movie or is it a series? I'm blanking Pretty on sure that right movie. now. Pretty I, sure I it's think, a yeah, movie. Yeah, right, it's a movie. Yeah. Uh, for Ghost of Tsushima, and it's getting a sequel instead of just setting that on the island of Tsushima again. Uh, we are located in Hokkaido for uh, the sequel here, and it's called Ghost of Yotai and follows a new hero called Atsu. And uh, yeah, with a lot of grasslands and snowy tundra uh, as the region, and it's at 300 years after the previous one i'm not a person who has i own the game you know i haven't played it it's well it's one of those games where like i i didn't buy the game but my brother owned it and like it's not i'm not spending money on a game again that i'm not playing but uh kevin is also doing a replay of it like as we speak he's probably like playing <laughs> it right now and i know you've played it at least twice right yes so a sequel to this coming out and i love that they have been cooking this game up and not been like sharing anything about it and then it's boom next year it's supposed to come out i don't know how far along it is how much crunch we can expect uh but hopefully it doesn't cost 400 million like concord but uh you're you're pretty excited about this right yeah i mean it's it's ghost of tsushima was really fun especially for the i, I guess for one it's getting adapted into a movie and i think that the narrative of ghost of tsushima was a lot of fun uh, i'm very mm -hmm. much a single player gamer more than a multiplayer one so when i have a great narrative i immediately get hooked into it um and it's not the only adaptation uh thing we're getting obviously i mean today in the news at least we finally have a trailer for last of us season two which we'll talk about shortly but Ghost of Tsushima also had a really fun uh, Kurosawa mode where it was black and white film grain and it made it feel like a classic Kurosawa movie with the the audio going almost mono like it, it was like they really respected sort of uh Japanese samurai movie mm -hmm. stylization and they brought that into the game so even though yes it's a video game it's video game news they have a lot of inspiration from samurai movies which was super exciting uh, I'm keen for this. Uh, as I said, I really loved the narrative. I also found the game just to be so, so beautiful. Uh, I'm not a big gamer on TVs, but it was one game that I had to play on on that TV just so I could get everything in. I just didn't feel like the... Yeah. I've only got 27-inch monitors. I just didn't feel like it gave it justice. So, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super keen for a sequel, especially since it's also not a direct narrative sequel, because uh, obviously yeah. 300 years, uh, Jin Sakai, he's dead. He's definitely dead. Uh, and, and his legend, I guess, maybe lives on in uh, the new character whose name I do not know yet, unfortunately, but uh, Atsu, I'm super keen. Atsu, I'm yeah. super keen to see where they go with the narrative. Yeah, and I mean, you play as a woman character, which I don't, I don't even feel like it's like worth stating in this. Although, you know, the expected internet reaction is always like, woman in video game. Uh, I don't know. I didn't see a lot of that, uh, but I also didn't really look at anything because I'm like, I'm taking the news in and then I'm talking about it with viewers to, so we can keep saying and it's not just like, you know, the dumbness that is uh, always uh, thrown around to stupidity in the internet on the internet but i can't wait to like play this and if you are located this is like a localized shout out here but if you are in australia there's a bunch of 4k restorations that they're about to show from akira kurosawa in the theater so hey if you are going to the theater next week maybe I have a look around and uh, yeah, there might be some showings for some classics that I don't know when you'll get to see them in 4K on the big screen. If that like, you know, it's going to be a few rare opportunities to so make the most of that. It's basically it when it comes to the news. The, maybe we'll talk a bit more about some of these quick news items. But uh, Lachlan, let's rattle through all the news in film this week. Micah Monroe is set to star in The Hand That Rocks, the Cradle remake for 20th Century Studios. A Barbara Streisand documentary is in the works from Frank Marshall. Paddington 4 is already in the works, targeting a 2027 to 2028 release date. Marvel is going to be campaigning Deadpool and Wolverine for awards consideration. This is probably the most fun article we've got here, including <laughs> acting categories, best actor for Ryan Reynolds and best supporting actor, Hugh Jackman. It's going to be, hey, a sweep, a Deadpool sweep. And then Tim Roth has been cast in the Peaky Blinders movie alongside Killian Murphy, Barry Keegan and Rebecca Ferguson. A Robocop TV series is in the works over at Amazon Prime. Peter Octo from Black Sails and The Office will serve as the showrunner and James Wan is set to executively produce it. Then a Diddy documentary is in the works at Netflix. I'm surprised that it hasn't already been released before it yeah. even came out because they're that yeah. quick with it, that opportunistic. But it will focus on Diddy's charges of sex trafficking and racketeering and the sexual assault and violent abuse allegations. And it's ex executive produced by 50 Cent. Wow, okay. Uh, Martin yeah. Scorsese's Jesus movie and Frank Sinatra biopic have been indefinitely delayed. There was plans to shoot both of these movies back to back this year, but that will no longer happen. Yeah, we don't have any more details on it. I don't know what these specific reasons are. I hope they're not like health related, but uh, let's hope they get back on track uh, sooner than later. Then Pixar's first long forum series, Win or Lose, has been delayed to February 19th. James Cameron has joined the board of directors for stability AI. Quote, I was at the forefront of CGI over three decades ago, and I've stayed on the cutting edge since. Now the intersection of generative AI and CGI image creation is the next wave. Lot to talk about there. <laughs> and then Andy Serkis says he's working on a new narrative project that will include AI character. He describes the story as 2D characters using voice actors coming into an AR world where they become AI characters offered by artists and directors. Okay. Margot Robbie and Jacob Elordi are set to star in Catherine and Heathcliff, an Emerald Fresnel's adaptation of Weathering Heights. Then Terrence Winter reveals details about the scrapped uh, Gotham PD series set in the, the Batman universe. It would have followed a third-generation cop in a largely corrupt Gotham City, and it would have been a 1970s-style cop show uh, inspired by Prince of the City. Mike Flanagan's The Life of Chuck is closing a distribution deal with Neon. The film will likely release in the summer of 2025 and will receive an award push in the fall. So no awards nominations for that movie, I guess, this year. Uh, but hey, maybe this next one, Nobody 2. <laughs> we'll sneak in there. No, probably not. Uh, that also comes out in August uh, next year and has wrapped filming recently. Mike Feist is to star in Zoe Kazan's East of Eden series adaptation for Netflix. He will play Carl Trusk, the role played by James Dean in the 1955 film. 
Chon Chen will be honored with her Career Achievement Award at the third annual celebration of AAPI Cinema and Television on November 12th. Chen will be celebrated for her notable career and most recently her acclaimed uh, performance in Diddy as the mother, which we literally praised a lot two weeks ago, and she's getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, a career achievement award really happy for her and that's it for the quick news lots of stuff to get through anything that stood out to you Lachlan that you want to discuss a bit further yeah just a quick <laughs> yeah. just a quick one on the James I mean you fucking just literally highlighted I, it as I, as I said it I was like, uh, you know exactly what I want to talk about James Cameron has joined the board of directors on Stability AI he was at the forefront of CGI over three decades ago and has stayed at the yeah. cutting edge since now at the intersection of generative AI and CGI image creation is the next wave. So I am still on the fence about generative AI. I feel like uh, mm. I've, I've made my position quite clear, but as like a TLDR of it, it definitely can be used as a tool to help uh, creatives generate things. Uh, I think a, a fantastic example I like to give is motion capture uh performance capture it is performance capture but you still have an artist going in afterwards and editing the performance to be digitalized so there is still that human touch there it's not just the actor takes we, we take that information we put it in a computer and we spit out a different image there is still a, a creator there and i think that generative ai is a fantastic tool if we're trying to get a template to start off with because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, when you're creating CG objects, you are often grabbing from a pool of pre-made things and you are then customizing it to suit your needs, right? At the end of the day, they are all just polygons and all polygons eventually come down to X amount of sides. Uh, it's a very, very simple way of looking at CGI. It's, it's a lot more complex than that, I'll be honest. But at the end of the day, I think a generative AI within the CG space definitely makes sense. And definitely having a at least people who can say, yes, this is what we will allow, this is what we don't allow, is probably not a bad idea in, in saying, yes, we will allow AI into our, uh, into our field in, of work if it is going to help benefit our creatives and not take jobs away from those creatives. And I think that's a very important thing to distinguish. Yeah, him being on the board, I, I don't see, like, obviously this isn't saying that after avatar or even within avatar he's now going to utilize as much as he can whatever it feels like staying on the forefront of not missing out on a new technology because he's always been there at least like this specific news thing with james cameron i don't really see it as a bad thing to have someone yeah. as creatively involved in the whole process of filmmaking um being there making decisions and giving input when I, I don't know who else is on that like board for example for stability AI, uh, but it's a good thing that he's he's there. Uh, ultimately, um, whatever it's used for is going to be yeah, a bit a bit more difficult because I feel like ultimately it never really works that way. That you always have to touch up in the end because generative AI is like often. Like when you create something from scratch, you can adjust it. But with generative AI, I don't know how finicky it gets once something like comes out of it, how much you have leeway to play around with it. It feels like it's just like, obviously there's like a lot of versions of AI in this generative AI thing that also such a like big term as well, like what it actually means. That could very much be like developed just for the filmmaking side, which is a lot of what uh, Cameron did for 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 his films uh, you know if you go back to the abyss and like the early CG generation it it's great to have him there I feel like it, that is a, a nice guy and he he's one of you know talking about Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis later I don't think he's one who's lost his marbles yet <laughs> like you know he's getting older but I feel like he's still got a grip on life <laughs> and I can't say the same about Francis Ford Coppola in a lot of ways but uh but yeah Sorry, I just so, like we're talking about AI, and I need to I need to <laughs> jab in from friends, looking at their website. Essentially, they are sort of like a uh, a company that is making AI products that are open source. And mm -hmm. to to me, it looks like they're trying to go about an ethical way of doing it. So they've got safety principles, safety first, open source, banning AI misuse, experts collaboration, ensuring data integrity, transparent, transparent AI content, 
um, encouraging responsible use. So, and a lot of these, if you read into it, like banning AI misuse is we strictly ban the misuse of our AI for illegal and harmful purposes and proactively safeguard our platform through continuous testing and identification of vulnerabilities. So it seems like they're, they're going, look, we see the applications of AI, uh, but we just don't want this to be out there as a tool that can be used to, to damage people. Um, and yeah. looking at the board of directors, um, essentially... He's only creative on that. He, well, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. The rest is obviously like CEO and executives and, and, and whatnot. But uh, yeah. to have him on there, obviously, he's probably going to get some insider goss into to what's coming up next. Um, and this is such a heavily, quickly, uh, rapidly changing environment. Like each week, it's mm. like, here's a new uh, AI platform that can do X, Y, and Z, and look how much better it is, and look how quickly we can generate uh, this content. So it, it, it's, again, it's an interesting world, and there definitely is a use case for AI within a creative space. It's not a replacement of humans and i think that's the, the the main thing is we don't want to lose the human touch after all yeah i agree uh i think there's there's nothing else here that i would uh take a closer uh, would want to take a closer look like uh, i look at it's probably obviously a bit funny that like they're campaigning it but uh, this is also like a headline that's kind of funny to read but it's also what a lot of movies do and a lot of studios just campaign everything for your consideration because yeah. it doesn't hurt to do it. So it's not like they, they actually like try to get them in. The only thing that they could like realistically aim for is maybe visual effects. But even those, I don't think were the greatest in Deadpool and Wolverine. Rarely do we get like a, a pure comedy blockbuster uh, nomination for especially in performances. But Lachlan, one of the best TV shows, was it last year that it came out, right? The Last of Us season one um, premiered to a lot of success and was one of the catalysts to say that this next wave of game adaptations are actually going to be uh, potentially successful um, for an audience interest, but also to uh, on a quality standard uh, across the board for audiences and critics. And we both felt the same that the first season was great. I played through the first game. I still have not, although I wanted to like straight away, like, oh, let's lead it to part two for me. I still haven't played it. So I don't want any spoilers, <laughs> but we get a lot of uh, like new characters uh, introduced to us and an overall uh, great vibe for a trailer. I think this really set the stage of yet another um amazing season to come uh, i'm very excited for for the second season of the last of us uh from my understanding they have made some changes from the game which i'm excited to see i think that we can all agree that uh the changes that they made in the first season were mostly for the better i think that even the extensions mm. of narrative like uh bill story getting his yeah. his own narrative was was wicked uh, I, I could definitely see where they might go a little bit deeper uh, with with this narrative. And I am not 100% sure, but this can't be the entirety of part two. Part two is a significantly longer game than the first one. So mm -hmm. I could definitely see this being e even maybe the first five hours of the game uh, and, and ending season two with a there's a there's a definitely a spot that you could end it at where where there is in, in the in the second game i'm trying to be as general as possible uh so that i don't yeah. spoil anything for you part of me as Thank well you. doesn't want you to play the game i would love really? to see what your reaction would be to the narrative they present without knowing what happens in part two because i've played part mm. two maybe like three times now um, in fact, I booted it up a few weeks ago to play it again, just because I've been wanting to replay part two again. Hand on my chest, I'm not a liar. I was a part two hater at first, but I've actually come mm. around to enjoying part two uh, a lot more, especially where, where they went. And I'm excited to see where they go, because I think that they would probably be a bit better of a narrative as a TV show than it would be as a video game. That they're for things that they do, but because uh, there's stuff that they do in part two that you don't necessarily enjoy. But it, it, anyway, I'm excited for this. I'm very mm -hmm. keen. I think this trailer does a fantastic job setting it up. 
Uh, if you don't know anything about the narrative, you're kind of just like, this is a great trailer. For those who have played the game, you know exactly what's happening in a lot of these scenes and where they lead to. And you go, holy fuck, I remember that. You're like the, the, uh, the, yeah, Leo, uh, the Leo meme. The, oh, that, I uh, felt that too in a way that like a lot of these clips felt like there was something like you could you could feel it in the performances that there was a, a, a bigger thing happening. And that was actually like quite nice to see that the emotional way. It's not just like reaction shot of like this is who's in the series, but they picked it felt like scenes that that are, uh, people would not know uh, where they're from. And I've seen some uh, like comparisons already where like the, with the guitar one. Um, and stuff like that. I don't know if I can hold myself back. It really depends on when this show comes out in 2025. Uh, I think season one was an early, early end of year premiere, right? Yeah. Uh, and I assume it will pre probably be like a February, March release again. And, and then maybe I could, I could hold off on, on playing it. It would be interesting to play the game after uh, the season comes out as well. But, but we'll have to wait and see if we can actually, if I can actually hold myself back then. Yeah, and speaking of sequels, Moana 2, uh, the series turned uh, cinematic sequel, comes out November 27th. Um, it's not the first trailer for uh, this movie, and I gotta say, this trailer really had me worry worried, because I liked the first Moana quite a bit. I like that movie, uh, has a, a bit of charm to itself. Uh, it's obviously not like you know, a Disney renaissance kickoff in a way that it's like that amazing. But I, I, I like the songs. I remember when, like, after I saw it, I kept singing it under the shower. It's like, oh, yes, I'm going, <laughs> like, stuff like that. Like, it's got some tunes in it. And I thought that this was just a collection of quick one-liners and bits. And if that's the whole movie, that is going to be unbearable. Uh, but but what, what did you think of uh, this quick glimpse into this? Uh, well, I'm not a massive Moana lover, but I really do appreciate the movie. I thought it was quite good. Uh, I don't yeah. care uh, about this trailer because it really didn't do much for me. Uh, we'll see if I'm forced to watch it in a few months' time. <laughs> uh, well, I think November, I don't know. I actually don't know. I, we, I don't know if we have planned that far ahead, but I think... No, it actually is one of our main reviews. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Maybe we'll, we'll see. We'll Man, see. I'm so glad I get to watch Gladiator two one week. The next week Moana two. So, oof. yeah, it's yeah, the month a bunch of sequels. You know. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Anyways, we got yet another spin-off thing, kind of prequel, whatever, uh, in the John Wick uh, universe with ballerina uh, after a long, a long. <laughs> waiting around for like reshoots and all of that we get the first trailer for that that also kind of spoils that uh john wick is going to be appearing in it too I, luckily you're of the opinion that they should have saved saved that right not sure they should have saved that yeah i'm mm -hmm. that would have been a fantastic like reveal uh ian mcshane i think his name is uh mm -hmm. at the start like him being in it i was like yep sure no worries continental uh yeah lance raddick have as Corona well, there, lance like, raddick in there as well like i get it in this, but yeah. to have john rock up in the trailer was a little bit annoying because i felt like that would have just been a fun reveal to have in the cinema or at least leave it for like a later because this is the first fucking trailer we're getting for this and it's like boom john wick's in it and it's i was really hoping that they could separate it and have it be independent but from what you were telling me is that the advertisements that you've seen of this movie uh, have all been John Wick. Uh, well, not the, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, I, I think it's fine. Uh, but what they showed us like early on, uh, one of the distributors in Switzerland showed us some stuff. And now that the trailer's out, I feel like I can, I can save that. But they, they were focusing quite a bit on, on John Wick. And it's well. like, it's also not Also like the movie. way that they phrased it, Lionsgate, like, you know, from the world of John Wick. Yeah. Like Colin... Uh, well, like it's the same as like Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. You're not going to get away from the main character of that world. And that's the fucking yeah. problem is that, but then you got to advertise it and you got to get people to come in. Still calling it Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, still didn't get people's butts into seats because it flopped in cinemas. So yeah. just call it the Ballerina. Hobbs and thing, right? Yeah, yeah, Hobbs and Shaw, Fast and Furious, whatever. Presents. Yeah, right. Because, yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> they're trying so to advertise. Silly. This fucking isn't there a like a um it's not to the exact same extent but 
the Fantastic Beasts series. Like the first one, yeah, yeah. Fantastic Beasts. The rest of them, not Fantastic Beast movies, but they added it on there to get people to get to the cinema to watch it. Um, I mean, you yeah, can yeah. literally it's call it be the secrets a... of Dumbledore and people exactly, will be there because yeah. they know they know who the fuck Dumbledore is. But anyway, yeah, sorry. Would have been a way. And then what, what the crimes of Grindelwald? Yeah, like yeah. those are better titles. But I guess they're so worried that people wouldn't see. Anyways, this is also, you know, Lionsgate. And I <laughs> I feel like they, they need a sure hit. I got to say, you know, apart from all of like how they presented in, within the John Wick universe, the action looks a ton of fun um yeah. and i think that's always been the standout for john wick it's not like there's a great narrative although people have been eating that up especially for part uh, four i think it peaked with part three and like all of the action and the spectacle just like with parabellum at at, at its uh heights but um Parabellum. at least for that i think i'm I'm intrigued as like uh you know someone who's slowly warming up to um watching more action stuff and actually appreciating it a bit more i think Kevin has had an influence on me for westerns and for action films. He's just kind of shamed me into watching more. Yeah. And you can't help but appreciate it then. I love the John Wick movie. I won't go. I Should I go get all my John? I've got all my John Wick 4Ks. I recently got all the John Wick movies in 4K. Uh, I'm not going to do it. I also love Atomic Blonde. Atomic Blonde was a lot of fun. Uh, they just had some narrative issues. I enjoy that action. The style of action that they do in these movies is a lot of fun. And I can see that in Ballerina. I'm keen for more of that. And Anna Diamas, she can act. And I really liked her in uh, No Time to Die. Uh, even yeah. she was only in it for like a, a brief moment. She was a lot of fun. She can carry a movie. And I'm keen to see her in a predominantly main character action role and not just something drama-esque uh, because she can act. She can do a great job. She's great. Mm. Maybe it's because I watch... Too much Blade Runner 2049, I like it too much. But, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I love Ana Diamas. I, I... We'll be here first day to cover that one as well. And uh, hopefully it will... I think within that John Wick universe, there's stories that are left to tell with great action that are worth telling, um, mm. even though it is, like, just continuation of a franchise that is easily profitable. Then um, something that we... Uh, well, we, as I say we, but it's Kevin and I. I'm sorry, Lachlan. Uh, that we caught <laughs> at the Venice Film Festival uh, last month, or no, actually earlier this month, um, Maria is uh, having a vague November release date that got picked up by Netflix. So you'll see it there sooner than later. Uh, Kev gets to rewatch it because it's also playing at the Ghent Film Festival. And just as an impression for you, uh, Lachlan, are you like interested in this like third outing in the Pablo Lorraine to tortured it. women series? Well, yeah, you've I seen Jackie, you've seen it. Spencer. I've got, I've got to watch the third one. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that they're in any way kind of connected, but no. I, th I think there's also the, the way the trailer great. plays it. Uh, I I didn't love Jackie. I think it was good, and then I quite enjoyed I think Spencer, and I think Maria opportunity was also just kind of for actresses uh yeah, yeah. great showcases to to really have a, have a character to chew on um i think mm -hmm. that it was like uh it's natalie portman natalie portman mm -hmm. in jackie is is fantastic even though you might not love it i think that it's a, a great opportunity for her to do something uh with with some chops on it i think even more so the same with christian stewart i think christian stewart obviously had this wacky i mean crazy start had these really interesting indie roles and then did Jackie and it was like, wow, no, she can she can definitely act. And, mm. I mean, the same goes for Robert Patterson. Robert Patterson did the same thing where he had crazy, like, start with Twilight, did some weird indies and did something like The Lighthouse. And it was like, holy fuck, man, this guy, he's, and now he's doing, like, Mickey 17. And it's the same thing for Jolie. But Jolie's more interesting in the fact that she's had a career, she knows what she's doing, she's she can act, but now she's like, I want to act and sing. The, well, the singing part is actually like a huge part of it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, she sings, a, there's a bunch of sequences where like she sings the full song. Um, and we were talking about this as well, like how much of it, because she did extensive training for like nine months as well. Um, and how much of it is her versus like maybe there's a mix. We both agreed, uh, Kevin and I, that like regardless, it is truly impressive what she does, especially in the singing moments. Um, I just found like 
the portrayal of her, like this portrait of her, uh, a bit lackluster. I didn't find her like too I interesting. Uh, I found some of the like supporting players a bit more, um, yeah, captivating. But anyway, like it's 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 an interesting film to like close the series on. Although I don't think it's like the the best of the three. Yeah, certainly works. Spencer. Here. Spencer? I like Spencer the most, yeah, yeah. I think this would, like, yeah, I, I think I like this a bit more than Jackie as well. Um, yeah. Jackie, to me, is, is probably at the bottom there. Then, uh, the last movie I want to have a look at is Sinners. Uh, comes out March 7th and is the latest film from Black Panther and Creed director Ryan Coogler uh, and stars Michael B. Jordan. They've uh, collaborated on a bunch of films together. And, uh, yeah, we initially didn't really know, you know, what we're in for. Is this more like an action film? Is it like an intense drama? What does it bring? Then it feels like it's a horror film. Uh, so super yeah. intrigued to see this, right? It had a certain atmosphere to it. The trailer had a nice pace to itself. Uh, I has a super interested. And uh, the tagline says, dance with the devil. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm, I'm super keen for this. Uh, the trailer really intrigued me. Uh, I think it did a great job getting me excited for something that I had no idea anything about. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah, me too. And, yeah, I'm, I'm super keen, uh, especially with that tagline, Dance with the Devil, because I have no idea what the creature is. And I hope that, fuck, man, I hope they do the same thing uh, that every good horror movie does and you don't show the creature straight away uh, and, and you just let that build because there is nothing scarier than your imagination. So yeah, I'm super keen for this. Uh, I'm super excited. Yeah, me too. And, uh, again, out early next year could be a very fun, like horror thriller. And I, I love that horror films have had, especially this year, like a strong year, uh, long hold uh, on this whole year. We've gotten like every other month, we've gotten a pretty solid horror film. As we are heading into October, we might have already gotten the best horror films of the year. And uh, that's a great thing. Then uh, there was also two trailers uh, that we're not going to talk about more, but there was a Thunderbolts trailer. I thought that was so, so, so trash that I can't I say it. more than it was. So, yeah, no, I, <laughs> I didn't link seen it, it to you. I, I didn't link it to you because like, I don't want to subvert you to that. That would be cruel. And then Gladiator 2 also had another trailer that showed basically the same that it already had. Uh, maybe even more uh, like story spoilers. Uh, so not not worth checking out there, but yeah, no. Thunderbolts looks like a bunch of like n nothing, <laughs> just nothing. <laughs> it looks really bad. That's it for the news this week. Then consider uh, subscribing and leaving a like on YouTube. If you are over on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, leave us a leave us a rating. Helps us out uh, greatly uh, to get into festivals to bring you more reviews. And the news, which Lachlan accurately says that we are more a news podcast at this point than a review one. But let's talk about what we've been watching this week. So tell me, you've prepped for Coppola with Coppola. Yes, uh, I'm s slowly going to make my way through his filmography. Uh, I realized I have a large percentage of his films missing. Uh, and what I mean by that is pretty much the only one I've seen is Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now. Now. Uh, yeah. And I have actually seen large chunks of his other movies uh, through studying them, just not watching the full movie. I, I you know, you, 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 when you, when you study film, you don't watch a lot of movies. You watch a lot of parts of movies because you break them yeah. down. At the end of the day, a movie is just a big, long narrative chopped up into parts, and you've got to break those parts down to see how they work. So I've watched quite a bit of, like, you know, like Jack, The Conversation, uh, The Rainmaker, but I don't think I've ever, from start to finish, watched any of them. And I've seen Apocalypse Now a bunch of times, like, because I, I, I rate that shit, but never really got onto his other stuff. So instead of watching The Godfather, which I still continuously put off to this day, even though I have all the 4Ks, uh, I decided to watch the one that everyone's like, what the fuck is this? And that's Bram Stoker's Dracula, which got me super excited because I know so much about this movie, but I've never actually sat down and watched it. And holy fucking shit, this movie is like crazy. Uh, from a, like, we already know from a performance standpoint, we're just not going to talk about the accents, but... Gary Oldman is just wild, but Anthony mm. Hopkins, he just steals the show, doesn't he? He's just wild. He's just, ah, oh, he's a crazy, crazy character. Production design, set design, uh, 
costumes, everything that's visually on screen is is spectacular. And I think that some of that's going to pop up later in the episode. Heads up, there's a little spoiler for you for Megalopolis. Um, Megalopolis. And I think that, like, uh, I, I think his, like, costume sold a few months ago for, like, a couple million dollars or something like mm. that. Like, Gary Oldman's suit sold for a couple million. Yeah. And I get why, because it's fantastic. Yeah. The shadows, fantastic. But at the end of the day, uh, it's a little bit, it doesn't, hasn't aged very well. I'm not going to lie. I don't think mm. the film's aged fantastically uh, for being, you know, 30 years old at this point. Um, so the film hasn't really done a fantastic job aging, but I think that it has a special place in my heart for young Richard E. Grant. Uh, I think that's uh, where this movie lies for me. Uh, you know what else I watched? Kingsman. You, I, so a bit of lighthearted entertainment there, a bit of action. Yeah, Tanika hadn't seen it, and ah. she was she'd yep. seen it on 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 the social medias and was like, we should watch it. So uh, we watched one uh, the other night, and then we watched two the other night as well. And then uh, we started to watch The King's Man last night, but a little bit mm. too tired to finish that. Uh, so she's going to watch that on her own time. I don't mind not rewatching that one. That one is not a favourite. Um, but iffy. as it goes, I think the first one still holds up really, really well. I think it's like a lot of fun, uh, especially for how yeah. wild the characters are. If you don't take it seriously, it's great. And I think that the second one got a lot of shit for not taking itself seriously as well to a point that it was just a ridiculous movie. But if you think about it, the first one is also ridiculous. It's just that that one takes yeah. it to a another another level um i do yeah. think julianne moore's villain has more opportunity to be better i think that samuel old jackson was just a lot of fun as the villain uh where julianne moore was just like a crazy psychopath and it was like yeah but it's gonna be more to the character at least mm. with samuel old jackson's villain it was like yeah he hates global warming he's gonna fix it like he was like he's he's good in his own mind right and he's technically a good guy at the end of the day whatever whatever um, Julianne Moore is just, you know, she was willing to kill a billion people for money and, and whatever. But, uh, yeah, Pedro Pascal is fantastic. I love him. I actually love everything to do with the Statesman in the second one. That's just, yeah, it's so much fun. Um, yeah. and finally, I think the most interesting thing that I watched this week, uh, cause I found it on YouTube for free, which was, I, I love that. Um, and honestly, it is a filmmaker who I have been meaning to watch his filmography because I have watched so many moments in his filmography. I've just never sat down and watched any of them from start to finish. And if I'm honest, the only reason I got Mubi, which recently I got it, was because one of his movies are on there. But then I noticed that this movie was on YouTube and a couple of these others are on YouTube. Um, Stalker. Uh, Andre Tarkovsky, uh, it's, it's a filmography. Yeah, yeah. Tarkovsky is a filmmaker <laughs> that I've been. What? What? I was just, just like, I don't know. You just mumble through the last name. I was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Tarkovsky. 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 Because the way I. Tarkovsky, it, when I say it, I want to like quickly get through it, just as just the way I speak mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just like, I, I don't want to say the K, I'm just like Tarkovsky. Uh, but anyway, uh, Tarkovsky. There you go. I actually pronounce it. No. Tarkovsky. Uh, <laughs> You're missing still the K. <laughs> no, I said Tarkovsky. Uh, whatever, fuck off. Uh, with your fucking accent. Um, I started watching this movie, Stalker, uh, knowing a little bit about it. Um, I've seen moments from mm -hmm. it. And if I'm honest, for a it's movie a that came out in 79, I was. So I've only watched 45 minutes of it because I was quite tired the other night. And mm. it's two, hour, two, two hours and 41 minutes, two and a half hours long. So it's a bit of a long one. And a lot of it is talking. So it's a lot of reading because obviously it's all in Russian. And I was absolutely stuck to the screen. And I had to, so I, I got up to about 45 minutes, which is about when they enter uh, the zone. And mm -hmm. I, you know how I told you like ages ago, like if I ever got to make a movie, it would be like FBI agents and fucking like paranormal Mafia. cult shit. Something like that, yeah. And then if I got to make another movie, it would be like set in a like a zone like this where crazy, wild, weird stuff can happen because yeah. it's one of my other favorite like settings as well. 
So I stopped watching it because I, I had to sit down and watch it. I'll probably watch it tonight, most likely. Uh, I might start from the beginning again, or at least maybe like another like 30 minutes back because there's a, like a montage of them getting into it. There's a lot of dialogue, but getting into the zone is a lot more action-y. Um, but I am super keen to continue on because I know it's like two hours of just a bunch of blokes walking through this zone and just talking. And yeah. have you seen it? Have you seen it? I Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a bunch of Tarkovsky, but this was one of the uh, like later ones I watched. I, I think I watched this one last year at some point yeah um because we we started uh one of our like i when i came back from studying film with you in australia i came back and started this this film club with my brother when he was like i think 15 and mm. one of the first films we watched was solaris uh yeah and you know obviously also like super influential when it comes to uh sci-fi and uh, it's just very different of what you expect the film to be because all of his films play out slowly. There's, there's a certain mm. patience that you need to bring with it, uh, but then they hold like a lot of a lot in them, um, and especially visually, they're quite striking. Maybe not in an outstanding way, but just I don't know subversively. There's a lot in there, so I'm fascinated by his filmmaking. Although like Soccer wasn't my favorite of his, I think it's a it's a really really strong film. Yeah, I know it's it's is one of his most popular. Um, yeah, at least at least from a, a group standpoint. But I'm 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 super keen to to finish it because I would like to watch Solaris. I'd like to watch Mirror. I'd like to watch The Sacrifice. I feel yeah. like I'm in a point right now where uh, I was reflecting on studying film and i i kind of miss like breaking down film breaking down moments so that's kind of what i've been doing is like i've been watching parts of of movies and now i'm like and i've been doing that for months now and now i'm at a point where i'm like i really want to sit down and watch x filmography and i feel like uh yeah. tarkovsky is a yeah there's a k there there thank you <laughs> Uh, I think Tarkovsky. Thank you. Ta -ta -ta ah, ta yeah, you had it once. Tarkovsky it's fine. is a very small but really uh, fantastic filmography. Uh, at, at least a dense, but but like his mise en scene is just oh, oh it's incredible. Like, yeah, it's incredible, and I feel mm. like I want to get back to just appreciating that. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you got seven uh, films, right? Seven full feature-length yeah. films, and then you threw. I've seen uh, seen five of them, uh, and all of them I would love to give give the time to rewatch. But it's always mm. something like you know, you're you're a big uh, perpetrator of like you need to be in the right mood, and especially for yeah. Tarkovsky, you need to be in in the, in the right mood to uh, mm. to take it all in in the mood for love another great movie um yeah i completely agree but that's what yeah. i've watched uh other than megalopolis which i was super excited to watch today and i cannot mm -hmm. wait to share my thoughts with you in just a few moments but first i think we have to hear your thoughts and all the things that you watched this week he's yapping again oh my god look at him uh no i'm keeping it br brief here uh sing sing you know premiered last year at tiff quickly uh like um popped coleman domingo into the conversation of best actor he got in for rustin that year for the nomination and this one yes i can definitely see why a lot of people think that this could give get him the award he's incredibly strong in this uh it's a uh, it's about the sing sing institution and um, basically these incarcerated men getting to have a different side to themselves outside of the maybe harsh reality, the rough reality where like toxicity uh, and appearing tough at all times is uh, really important just for your own survival and having a space where like that can be more broken down and artistry can come out like through through play really beautifully it is like something that they can hold on to to regain some sort of humanity when that has been stripped away from them through that you get coleman domingo who plays with a bunch of the actual people who are part or were part of this program it's not in in a way like this type of feel-good story of like you got these tough people and then they are united by something that they can all like agree with and it's all rainbows and sunshine it, it, it is still pretty dark and you can feel like the inner demons that they have to battle within themselves 
and I was I was really impressed because I saw the hype and I was like, it might be a cheesy story at the end of the day. Didn't feel that by the end. I think it has like one of the best endings of the year that just like has you collective. It feels like you're collectively like breathing out for what our character is going through. And then you're like almost maybe overwhelmed with emotions. I caught myself almost shedding a couple of tears. A really beautiful movie. We're going to talk about it a bit more uh, as as Oscars come around. I, I would be surprised if it's not like uh, a big contender there. And then Suzanne Beer, who has made uh, the Bird Box uh, movie. Uh, she's a Danish filmmaker known for her film After the Wedding that got remade and now she's has a series here uh, starring nicole kidman and liv schreiber who are like this rich couple that host a wedding for one of their sons and then someone turns up dead it's not uh actually like uh known at the start who is end up uh who ends up dead who who's killed oh it's like impl- like it's not clear did she die uh was it maybe an accident and as we unfold this this typical like who done it type thing where it does something that i really hate about the genre that is basically giving us a moment where like every person becomes a suspect at least for a little while until it arrives at the end point and i kind of don't like that type of who done it cuz it doesn't really give you the opportunity to figure anything out it kind of guides you along the way like these are all the such uh, sub- uh, these are all the suspects and why they could have done it but it there's nothing intriguing about this uh i found it kind of kind of shitty <laughs> to be honest it's really bad uh but it's certainly going to be popular over on netflix and then rosemary's baby uh i so director obviously piece of shit roman polanski happy when that guy finally passes uh but back in uh 60 uh back in 68 he made an iconic film that gets referenced uh a lot it's like oh my god it's just like rosemary's baby and i think this movie was good uh especially in its uh blocking and staging some of the performances didn't really get me maybe it was just because it's old and from the 60s that like there's a different type of acting style that i'm not totally vibing with but there's a lot of impressive stuff about it and i can see a lot of other influences being taken from this film but i just thought it was it was a pretty solid thriller but not like the most iconic one of the best films ever uh, I don't hold it in that high regard. And then lastly, uh, the Sundance uh, documentary with Will Ferrell and uh, his uh, long-term friend Harper Steele uh, is out on Netflix now. It's called Will and Harper, and it basically uh, sees Harper like transition uh, laid into her life uh, to a trans woman and then them going on a road trip uh, to basically reaffirm i haven't finished the film yet but i can already tell you like it's re- it's 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 already such a good documentary like it's already one of the best documentaries of the year uh you know and i just am really happy to see something like this cuz it's it's definitely like made for a i'd say cis audience that connects closer to to like will but from the wide uh net that he casts on people who are like at least mildly interested in whatever he does it like so naturally and without like forcing it down your throat just portrays this friendship between these two and then having conversations like so far i found it to be quite moving and beautiful and i can uh, recommend it a lot and i will finish it as soon as we stop talking about megalopolis but <laughs> Lachlan, Lachlan, it is time it is time to talk about the latest uh, 30 plus years in the making uh, the great, the if you can't see a better future, then build one, uh, aka Francis Ford Coppola's Little Baby. It's uh, what I title Megaflopolis, but it goes also by the title of Megalopolis. Uh, this film premiered to uh, a lot of hatred <laughs> and gone a lot of confused people. Some people loved it, especially for its ambitions that it has. Maybe not for the movie itself, but just what it maybe could be or what it could represent on the future of cinema. I just found it to be incredibly dreadful. And, you know, you, we already know that. We're basically here to hear from you, Lachlan, of what you thought of it. But first, could you tell us, what the fuck is this movie about? <laughs> With pleasure. Genius artist Caesar Catalina seeks to leap the city of New Rome into a utopia, idealistic future, while his opposition mayor Franklin Cicero remains committed 
to a regressive status quo, perpetuating greed, special interests, and partisan warfare. Torn between them is socialite Julia Cicero, the mayor's daughter, whose love for Caesar has divided her loyalties, forcing her to discover what she truly believes humanity deserves. I'm, I'm just going to not comment on that because I already have so many thoughts just about that logline alone. But the movie comes in at a runtime of about two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, like we discussed previously, the letterbox curve does remind me of Holmes because Switzerland has a lot of mountains and it goes up and down and up and down for a 2.7 average. On IMDb, it's a 5.8 and on Metacritic, a 56. Uh, it was made for a budget of reportedly <sighs> roughly around 120 million. I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually quite a bit more. And I think, well, it has like a release uh, coming this weekend. We record this on the Friday. Uh, as I can see, like letterbox reviews for more people coming in, but we don't have an estimate yet of where we'll land. I think it tracks to do less than, I think like 10 million. So around like the five to seven range. Uh, maybe it, it does more than that, but it certainly will not be a uh, box office success. But ultimately, I think what already has settled in for the narrative for Coppola is that this will be an underappreciated gem that will stand out in the future of cinema and people will come around to it. I doubt it for myself personally, but uh, we're going to break it down in full on spoiler fashion. So if you can't make it out to the theater, then Please don't, if you don't just really want to see it. I, I kind of, I get why the hatred that came out of, you know, Gun for this film sparked a lot of interest for it. But once you have to sit down and actually sit through the whole thing, I don't know how much of that is like still kind of funny and you're still in for it. But like, you got to tell me, because we speculated a lot that like, you know, this would make for a really good episode if you're like at a five star and I'm at a half star. So you don't <laughs> have to share your rating yet, of course, but... Just in general, like, what did you think of, of Megalopolis? So, at the end of the day, no matter what you and I say about this film, about how it's technically made, how it was brought to screen, how long it was in production for, at least how long it was in his head for, how long he's been writing it, at the end of the day, this is the final product we got. This is the final form that we may see this product. We're not going to get a director's cut because... This is a self-funded project. There is no company, big CEO coming in being like, listen here, artist, this is not how we want to see this. We want to add more narration. We want to add this kind of shot. We want to do this. We want to do that. There's none of that. This is Francis Ford Coppola, completely detached from any uh, corporate need yeah. to make money off of this, a $120 million self funded dollar film this is the final product we got i think it is wonderful that we live in a world where we can give this kind of opportunity to someone and they can make a movie i think that we are given this filmmaker an opportunity and, and we've given a filmmaker francis ford coppola the opportunity to make a movie that he wants to make he has had successes godfather series uh, apocalypse now he's had his flops which at the time you know, technically, Apocalypse Now was not appreciated by everybody. Dracula wasn't appreciated by everybody, but has come around. And yes, I get that. At the time, people won't appreciate it. But there is a particular thing that happens with meat. Now, Ewan, you may get this analogy, but you may not since you are vegan. But <clears throat> when you cook a steak, right? When you cook a steak, mm -hmm. there's different uh, ways you can have your steak cooked. You can have your steak blue, which, you know, if you have your steak blue, a good vet can bring it back to life. You can have it, you know, just a little bit less, you know, little tss, and then off to the mm. plate. You can have it how I like it, which is medium rare, where it's been on the, on, the, on the grill for a little bit, but there's still a little bit of juiciness and blood and it keeps that flavor in there. You can have it well done. And I think the same thing can happen to an idea or at least a narrative that you can overcook a narrative that you can continuously leave it on the grill, sizzling in your mind, and without eventually getting it out there, you can go through so many revisions and changes that it feels like a first version draft of the film. Mm -hmm. I do not think this film is a half a star or one star rating because I actually think there are 
particular aspects of this film, especially around the production design, especially around the costuming, that I actually think is quite fantastic. I personally think the idea of a modern setting, and the reason I think this is cool is because because earlier on this week, I've had this whole week off um, from my work, so I've had a week to do things. I went to the city, and when I was in the city, Perth City is a fantastic area to have photography of buildings because you have a mixture of old and new and I lo- and I love that with cities where you have this really old architecture next to this modern uh, you know building or whatever mm-hmm. and I really love this idea of a modern world but roman I guess politics at its core and and roman influences at its core I I loved every element of that I loved the showiness of them I loved the uh you know, the, the societal standards of these, you know, almost godlike people, you know, these rich people, they have these golden white dresses, they're above everybody, they have this fantastic flamboyant lifestyle. Shia LaBeouf's character can be this uh, piece of shit, but he is still up in society and he can get away with almost everything because he has Papa uh, Hamilton Crassus III, who John Voigt, you know, it is a wild person to have, and I and I actually didn't think he was acting half the time. I thought he was actually just wheeled out of his retirement home, and he was like, "Where the fuck am I?" Um, <laughs> so there are elements to this film that I quite liked, but the unfortunate thing is that the narrative, the part that weaves us through the the story that he takes us on, is overcooked. It's it's taken too long to get this idea out so he has so many ideas he's trying to present to us in the narrative standpoint from both dialogue and narrative that it gets muddled and i do not think that is helped in any way by the editing of this film which i personally i'm going to say right now this film has the worst editing of any film in 2024 i think that it (laughs) cuts Uh... too quickly cuts away from things uh, one of the examples I had early on was when Adam and Aubrey Plaza's character uh, are kind of getting together and all of a sudden it just cuts to them on the floor and it was a weird time jump that just didn't need to happen but it almost happened like 30 seconds after the last line it just cut to them on the floor and I was like where is the natural progression to this because it was obviously meant to be like a sexy scene but there was no natural progression to it the the film's narrative isn't helped by this jarring editing of moments there is no flow to the film there is no link uh there was there is a link there's a fine thread that takes us through but it is such a fine thread that it kind of misleads you of where we're going to go for the narrative so the the reason i think this film is a flop to, to most audiences is because of its overcooked narrative. It's over, uh, it's it's story that he has been building for years and writing in his head for years. And he's probably gone through many, many iterations that he's just got too many ideas in this one story, you know, uh, too many cooks, yeah. right? The, the, the classic, the classic internet sensation, too many cooks, right? How many, did you can't eat too many cooks. And, and I think that goes the same with the characters. You have Caesar Cantilla, you have Maya Cicero, you have Julia, you have Wow, you have Claudia, you have Hamilton, you have uh, Fundy, which is his driver. You have so many characters that have their own agendas and narratives that this is a two-movie minimum. For the amount of characters that it has and the amount of storylines that it has, it needs to be split into two movies, but he doesn't. He only splits it into one and... I think that his grand scale of this idea, I don't know about you, but I really just, I really want a massive scale blockbuster. And I don't think anything has come close to that recently. And I know that Dune is a, is a great example of, of a big blockbuster, but I just don't think it scratches my itch for something. Because when I think grand scale, my brain goes back to like 80s fantasy uh, with that that weird like puppet like characters, and I feel like if this film was to be made, it should have been made in the eighties. It should have been made where it had a lot more practical effects, this breathing world, and not CGI. And I think that because he's made it in twenty twenty four, and he didn't make it in the late nineties or even in the late eighties, 
uh, even even early 2000s, he has got this weird CGI world which shouldn't be CGI. It should be brought into a reality. It should be practical. It should be this, especially the way it's designed. The, 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 the Mechalopolis that he designs is this plant-inspired breathing. It's meant to be a utopia. It's meant to kind of like, and obviously there's a, there's a, there's a uh, theme of us destroying the world. So his utopia is, is this sort of balance of like uh, plant building architecture. And that should be a practical effect as best as you mm. can. And if you made this movie 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you would have had a practical set. You would have had a practical effect done for this, but we're done in an era of CGI. And that doesn't mean I don't like the visual appeal of this film. In fact, halfway through, I said to me, I said to myself, because it was only me seeing this movie and there was like a bunch of other people and half the theatre left. I'm not going to lie. Like a bunch of people left throughout the film. Um, yeah. Part of me really wants this on 4K because I would happily, I would happily, if this is in some sort of Dolby, Dolby Vision, like uh, 4K DVD, I would happily use this movie to test displays because I think that it is really pretty in moments. I, I, I absolutely love, I'm sorry I'm going on a tangent here because I know that you, 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 you've I had your thoughts about the movie. basically say movie bad. I don't know. I don't You're, know much I know. else. <laughs> I'll but like movie bat. There were moments where I like I my my feelings on the film went like the letterbox scores. It literally went like mm -hmm. this because yeah, it was yeah. like okay, this movie opens super weirdly because it introduces the ability that uh Caesar can control time, but then it stops and it goes to this weird family drama That's, and then it's like yeah. okay, why is it doing this weird? Oh, they're fucking their sister, they're fucking their brother, they're fucking their cousin. Um this person's related to this person. I'm like, okay, fuck. That's a lot of shit that I've got to kind of... Oh, wait, hang on. Ewan, we've got to switch hats. I forgot. We have to switch hats. <laughs> it's, it's a Khan movie. It's a Khan movie. It's a Khan um, movie. There you go. And, and we've got this narrative of so many people that we're trying to follow. And I'm just like, holy fuck, there's a lot of names that are very similar that they're throwing at me. Uh, I need to remember this. And then it cuts back to this sort of timey-wimey stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's that's super weird. And there's such beautiful moments as well. Like, like my favorite moment, I think, in the film, and 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 I think visually was him driving through those slums, and you have these gigantic uh, and it was in the, in the trailers, but these gigantic statues moving and falling. And I thought that it was a fantastic, mm -hmm. beautiful moment that had so much a thought to it and some motifs to it. And I think the same thing applies to when that satellite, which is just such a random fucking plot point uh, that <laughs> the AI I forgot well, about and then it happens. But like when the satellite falls from the sky and you have the Statue of Liberty in that shot, that, that was stunning. That was beautiful. The silhouettes along the buildings of people crawling and hiding from this satellite that is about to wipe out part of the pop. Like, that was stunning. There are so many beautiful moments in this film that made me go, this guy is clearly the guy that made Apocalypse Now. And then part of me is like, this is the guy that made uh, some pretty shit movies as well. And that's why he's bankrupt. And he's probably going to go bankrupt from this because he has overcooked this film. So for me, the editing is is absolute horseshit. Like I can't think of any other movie that I've hated for its choice of editing e ever. Like like I feel like there are bad editing choices in movies, but this one just felt bad. It stands it felt out like the it was... most at the construction side to me. It's like that's where it like really oh. starts to be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> the way that Dude. everyone is in the scene and you don't know where they're standing what? and it cuts back and forth. It's and, and it felt like the, the same thing applies. Too many cooks. It felt like there were 20 people who were editing this movie and they all just had different there, there ideas of what they wanted to do. There were three editors? Yeah, there were three editors. It, it's and not like uncommon they, that there's multiple editors on a film, but yeah. you only need one editor. You, you do need one. The one is you need good. one. You need one. <laughs> yeah. Three, like what? Hey, Ewan, can you can you do all the can you do all the keyboard shortcuts? I will use the mouse, and then uh -huh. uh, someone else can like just sit back and say Wii pause. Remote. Yeah. One of them yeah, is yeah, with Wii motion. Remote. Yeah, yeah. Let me, <laughs> let me like use this control. Like uh, the it, the editing was just such a fucking sloppy mess. But there were moments yeah. that were like instead of a movie being okay, the editing's 
like okay, but shit at times. This was shit editing that gets good at times. It was backwards and that really annoyed me. Now, before I continue, uh, this is such a random plot, like the random moment for me, Ewan, but uh-huh. I-, I need to bring this up because one of the big things about this movie is the, 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 the facade of it all, right? The, 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 like this utopia. And yeah. you kind of called me out earlier in the recording and it's kind of giving away on my arm here. Can you see it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, uh, the, the, the green screen effect of your... I'm sorry, man. Oh, my God. I've had a rough night thinking about Megalopolis <clears throat> and crying over my, my baby, Lakamira. Because... Oh, I called this out, literally. What the fuck? As I said, I... I was anticipating this movie and I didn't realize how fucking messed up it would make me thinking about how bad this movie ended up being. Um, Megalopolis broke me. Like, it literally uh-huh. broke me um, mm-hmm. writing it. The, the, the editing was shithouse. The music was just boring. Like, there was nothing ever interesting about the music. It was like Hallmark music. movie type shit. There was never, a, there was never yeah. this peak. There was never a moment for Adam Driver just to act his acting chops. And Natalie Emmanuel just, she's not a bad actress, but she just didn't do anything for me is. that was exciting. I'm, I know your I opinion. I'm is. just being nice. I, I don't, I didn't have anything that really drew me towards any character. Um, mm. Even Aubrey Plaza, who I absolutely adore, I didn't enjoy. No one, and it's like no one did a bad job acting. It was just that these characters were boring. They had no development. They kind of just, they didn't have any highs, didn't have any lows. They were kind of just like this the entire time. They were just characters that existed yeah. in this world. The cinematography was mediocre, and at times it was spectacular, but at the most it was mediocre. Um, the characters were boring, but the, the, the thing that got me was just, like, the, the fact that it was just this... Because, like, obviously Roman politics is, like, super complicated, and the fact that he, his name was Caesar, I totally saw, like, some Cicero, backstabbing happening, right? Crassus, and, and yeah, it's all of it is, is references. I totally to, thought to there were going to be some sort of, like, I thought this was, I ended up thinking that, oh, maybe this is going to be, like, a modern retelling of some, like, Roman narrative. It's what it and, feels like early on, the way that they talk. Right? Like, and yeah. I got excited because I was like, this is probably why it's it's being treated. Sorry, one second. I can't let you see the the what's happening. Um, <laughs> were you, was it confusing why time never like changed? Like it was just it's just daytime the entire time. I I I, I thought I see something moving in the background. So like I can see stuff moving in the background. So it's a video. Yeah. So like yeah, that's it's all. Vi- it's a video. video. It's a video. It's a video. Yeah. Yeah. But it loops. Yeah, it's about a th- I guess. Yeah, it loops. It loops. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was going to organize like a, like the video to be like. I couldn't do it because it, these podcast recordings just vary in time. And I want to just yeah, have yeah. me walk into the door halfway through and then, like get something out of the fridge and then leave. Um, the thing was, I was going to try to hold this for as many episodes as I possibly can, but it's gotten so yeah. dark now that the screen is starting to appear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like anyway, anyway. It's but starting yeah. to flicker, yeah. Um, which is why I talked about set design because this set... De- this set design is just absolutely spectacular, <laughs> don't you think? Um, uh-huh. These are empty. Uh, I drank all these. Uh, this one is partially empty, like a little bit empty. Um, and that's just a bunch of cash. Um, anyway. Yeah. Don't look through my smoke and mirrors, uh, Magic Man. Um, but yes, sorry, where did I get up to? I, I really thought that this movie was not going to be loved due to you know, it being a weird adaptation of, like, a Roman narrative and, like, just, like, he doesn't age it well, but, like, he he's just making a movie out of time. If he made this movie 20 years ago mm. with more practical effects, with, I, I don't want to say, like, theatre actors, but I feel like if we had, most of these are, are, are TV actors, and I feel like if we had more TV and movie actors, I feel like if we had more theatrical actors, people who would really get into these characters of, of these, because it just felt like they were just modern day uh, yeah. Americans that just had these, like, they just, they liked Roman ideas. But like, imagine instead of like John Voight, it was, who would John be a fantastic. John Voight 30 years ago. Yeah, John Voight 30 years ago, right? Like, been, like instead of know. wheeling him out of the nursing home, <laughs> they like, yeah. like they actually have a, an actor who can perform. Um, because my god, I mean, was to just, me, like one of the most random things is that it starts off. Plaza's ass for like four hours. That's all he got paid yep. for. 
there's there's so many scenes where it feels like it's not part of the scene, but he just kind of does it. Yes, <laughs> like, I, like, I don't know what he's from. doing. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? And uh, to me, the most random thing is that it, it opens with you know narration by Lawrence Fishburne, Funny Romaine, who's like a driver slash assistant butler. I don't know what he is, but why is the narration told from his perspective? I don't I don't know why. And it's never why? explained. So the other thing yeah. as well is that none of the element like how does. Caesar Catalina have the ability to pause time uh, because it's it's an allegory for filmmaking maybe in a way too for like hey you pause time and that's okay yeah the act of creation okay so I... okay so we're gonna get into like the the like themes and stuff now right of like <sighs> themes like, themes and themes. one of the big themes you're going to have is Caesar is Francis. Even though he name drops himself as the child's name later on and I, I was the only person in the theatre that laughed when they go, so if it's a girl, it'll be this name and if it's a boy, it'll be Francis. I literally went, what? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I audibly laughed. The theatre in Gun was like roaring. Like, we, they were laughing at that too because oh, it God. was like basically like a, a gasp of like, he really just did that. <laughs> yeah, he really just did that, right? He really just and did that. And, thi and this is the final pro <laughs> No one said no to this man. No. Like, no one, no. no one said to this guy, hey, dude, no. this is a terrible idea. But any anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, also, really quick tangent, halfway through, it just becomes a music video for Grace Vanderwall and her singing yeah. with a ukulele, which- It's so the random. The first thing, it was just so random, but anyway, sorry, not to And not then to it's like, no, no, but it's like her singing, but then it's like, well, actually, to the plot, there's like porn that was created and it's AI yeah, yeah, and like- Oh my God, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Speaking like, of Roman Polanski, like, like they talk about him like, yeah. like having sex with her. And it, like, anyway, anyway. Uh, oh my god! But like to 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 talk about like themes, obviously one of the biggest ones is 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 this is like sort of autobiographical, right? Because uh, I, I in I a wouldn't, way, I wouldn't like call it that. I, I would say like especially that word. I would I would say that like it's inspired by a lot of the emotions maybe no. an artist and a filmmaker no. could have. No, do you think no. it's autobiographical? No, I I truly believe because. Francis Ford Coppola, I mean, the, 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 the moment that made me go, yes, I think this is more autobiographical, instead of being inspired, but like, like actually being about his life, is the moment that he gets out of hospital, uh, Caesar gets out of hospital, and all of his accounts are frozen. Like he has no money, but he still wants to create. Uh, and immediately yeah, yeah. my brain goes, that yeah. is part that, of Francis's yeah. story, is he had no money, but he had to create, so he had to, he had to do things. And, and like, for, for me, it, it it felt that you know he was never loved, and and it's the same thing. Francis's movies at first weren't appreciated, but then people came around to it, and eventually people came around to Megalopolis. He came, they came around to his idea, and yes, all yeah. of the start even pause with, creation thing. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, even with the Godfather, it was like obviously like an adaptation of a really popular novel, and first reactions to that were as well that like, oh, what is he doing? Like the novel is obviously better than this, and then. It, it started to yeah. like, yeah, get that acclaim later on. But to get back to the point that I made before we got into the theme th stuff is is obviously like the time moving. Even if you are going to make this a, like an allegory towards your filmmaking career that you have control, you are God or whatever, you still have to explain it within the world that we're set in. And this is where no. I think, yes. No. Yes. No. You can't just be, even in. Stella well, also, goes, the world is held together by love. At least it's all about love. explains it. Um, <laughs> well, I just peaked. I'm I so think sorry. it's really funny that Julia is also like in one of the moments where he like blows up an apartment building. She, for some reason, is in that time in the yeah. space. Like, she and can then, do it I, I don't as know well. why. How? Why? Yeah. So, okay. So, again, the other big thing about this movie is it tries to world build without world building. You just have to, yeah. you just have to kind of go along with the ride. There's no explanation as to why, well, but immediately yeah. you're like, the, immediately it's just like, okay, these guys fucking love, they, they, these guys went to one museum exhibition on the Roman Empire. This is literally just like the, how often does Ford Francis Coppola think of the Roman Empire meme? Like literally it is. every day. It is. That was my review coming out of Gun as well. Oh, really? Like, that meme was... That, that meme yeah, was that meme was at hot. the time, right? And I was like, it, my first thing was like a couple of thoughts on Megalopolis. And then my first line was like, I guess Francis Ford Coppola has been thinking about the Roman Empire. And it's just like, 
There's no explanation to why no. they 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 are so heavily inspired by this. There's no explanation to any of this. Cra- like, why? Like, is is Hamilton Crassus the only bank? Like, is it? Does he have a monopoly on? banking in this world it feels like no it feels like it's take takes the reality of like old rome and puts it into a new city so this new rome city has already been labeled after how rome was that's like i kind of you kind of need to buy into that but yeah then it also has a lot of like modern things like i feel like these characters and the story never exists out of, outside of the conversations in the very room they are in like the first yeah. bigger scene with adam driver and and uh john carla esposito is basically him going like whispering into his ear after he's confronted him like oh you didn't didn't you didn't you murder your wife and and make the like mega little thingies out of this and he goes like oh you were the prosecuting whatever like you should know i was like oh you're not talking to each other as people you are walking exposition machines that are on a different side of ideals old versus new but they never talk about like what specifically makes it all or makes it new it's always about like I have disposition and I have disposition, but they never go any deeper than that. And I found that the most frustrating. That's why, like, why I ultimately arrived at the half star. That none of it actually adds up to anything, ever. It's always just like another tie back, or but I'm never emotionally invested, like narratively invested, or intellectual, like n- not intellectually. Maybe it's the wrong thing, but like as the whole concept, I'm never like taken along a single time in this film, and I found it so. So frustrating. Oh my mm. god. Uh, it makes it makes yeah. that runtime of like 138 minutes feel like it's it's, double it's that. really long. Yeah. It makes you, well, it makes it feel double yeah. that because of how mm. how slow it can be if you're not pulled into it. Did they cut every couple of seconds though? So like, you know, at least uh, you you never get bored with one shot. You can see that like obviously he spends a lot of money on that. Uh that like there's a lot of different like obviously a long shooting process so that it must have been to me it comes back to this like obviously megalopolis metropolis a movie that was made by fritz lang about 100 years ago in 1927 uh a great film if you haven't because that's like one that i you know i try to go back to like in 100 years time could this be something you know that is viewed differently because obviously this is so different now from what we have where it stands out where we don't have like a ton of other films from the 20s to compare it to that are like quite different we got Nosferatu in like early 20 in the early 2020s and in, in the 1900s and then this towards the end of it as we still are in the like non sound time and you no know, the movie has idea it like puts them out there they are out there as well uh but it it adds together to something and just this movie just does not add up to anything and if you look at it obviously megalopolis is heavily inspired by the mega it tries to be like you know the the, the hundred years later century later version of this film and just just does not does does not does not work uh on it i think we we set most of the things right especially some of the performances to me were also quite frustrating but like you said, I don't really blame them. I think it it was just what they were given is so dumb. And what came out of Gun as well is like that at least Aubrey Plaza, Plaza seemed to have had a good time doing like her shtick. Hey, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. I guess. Five stars. I mean, her her writing Shia LaBeouf's face is like, while giving like very exposition heavy dialogue of what he should do is like, oh, so the way to manipulate them is just to tell them exactly what you want because that's not transparent at all. It's not like, you know, about a power dynamic. If you sit on someone's face, you know that that's connected to like them being subservient to you even once you've gotten off their face. And uh, that's just logic. <laughs> I guess that's what's happening here. Uh, it was just like a lot of these like stupid moments that are so laughable, but that that it, it doesn't feel like he loops us in for a joke or like some bigger thing that he does. It just always feels like it's, sincere i uh, i i'm i'm so at a loss at what i actually like about it i think some of the moments of especially like the shadow stuff that you mentioned towards the end there where he's like on his big thing and gives a speech about the future uh there's like a shadow that erupts from like an ape that like walks uh, like to homo erectus to homo sapiens and it's like oh okay that's that's a nice little neat thing but you can feel it's overstuffed like you said with the overcooked steak with so many ideas that it's just it's just a bit too much and none of it kind of works together it's like uh getting getting a meal and it's one part like 
you know, you got a taco and you got sushi and then you got a bunch of nails and then you get that all together and you stuff it in your fa uh, face. And that's that's this movie. Yeah, there's also like some surprising people in this. Like Jason Schwartzman, I guess, is, isn't is that big a character, yes. but I forgot I forgot that he is in it. <laughs> well, he's he's uh, related, so he gets a free pass into any of Coppola's movies. I guess, so. yeah, yeah. There's not that many related people who ma make it in here, I guess, other than uh, Shia LaBeouf as well, right? He's also... Yeah, that's a wild... That's a wild one. Again, other than that, was that your long list of, of notes done or do you have anything else? Because, again, I don't... Really <laughs> Look, I, I think that's the most... I think I got it most mostly out of there. I was like, I would really like to come back to this film later on, maybe in, like, 50 years, if I'm still alive. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but this is not a film that's that's I'm I'm ready to rewatch anytime soon. Um, I think yeah. that it just left a, a a poor taste in my mouth. I will watch the first hour of it in fifty years time, and if I like it, I'll continue to watch the last hour. But probably not. I think I got nothing to add there. Um, again, I didn't give it a complete rewatch. I just had a look through some of the scenes again. From that, I'm not changing my rating. Although I do think it's harsh. I think there are some things to enjoy about it the filmmaking the production design all of it i think kind of comes through you saying that maybe if it were made 30 years ago that it would have a bit more of a tangible feel to it and not just all feel glossy and fake like to me the first thing that stands out is like we got narration then it goes into a club scene and then it's outside but it's obviously like middle of the day and it's like okay the the it's basically hammering home i guess maybe a point that they party whenever they just do what they please but it's so it's so jarring it seems off something about it seems off from literally the third scene that we got and uh, it 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 doesn't get better from there uh so i'm going to stick with my half star rating for it uh but yeah i'm keen, I'm keen to hear like where where you and uh, arrived at as i said there are elements to this film that I adored uh, heavily, re really, really thought, wow, this could be one of my favorite images of the year on, on screen. But the way I described the editing, the film was bad, but in moments was good. That means it's a bad movie. So for me, I'm not going to give it half a star because I don't think that's, you know, it, it, it's not the worst movie of the year. I think, unfortunately, Borderlands still gets that, that, crown mm. um and i think i gave borderlands like a half star which means this deserves a a star for uh, not not for any of the technical reasons but i'm gonna give it a, a star as a participation award you you get one uh, star for every you get million. one star for <laughs> participating Spent. in the hollywood blockbuster uh yeah there, there we go yeah. there you go a there singular you. star that's I, I thought you would uh, go higher, but I guess we're not, you know, we didn't get that like five star versus half star debate, but I honestly think it's, it would be really hard to argue on that side other than maybe it's ideas that aren't fully realized in the film that like we yeah. said, there's too many, too many cooks, but the ideas by themselves, you know, maybe, but that would be a different movie. That's not what we got. So arguing on that behalf, which I've seen a bunch, like, oh, look at this. This is the future of cinema. It has so many ideas. Well, then make a movie that would be, in, like, you know, would have that in it, not just, like, all thrown together in, in a stew of mess that just tastes funny. But my double feature pick is a simple one. Uh, I think you should take a shower. And I, I took a shower this morning, and after this recording, I will take another shower because I just feel like taking a shower after talking about it, seeing clips of it, I just need to take a shower again, so I suggest you do the same. <laughs> um, so my initial double pick, because the entire time I was watching this movie, I honestly was thinking about Synecdoche, New York quite a bit. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that in terms of something that is similar, not in, not in just concept, but in terms of uh, plot narrative, uh, I think that Synecdoche, New York, shares some similarities to Megalopolis in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I think that Synecdoche, New York does a significantly better job at presenting the creative process. Yeah, Ag agreed. It's a great, great double feature pick for the tortured author but, who, with its but, many iterations. Are you going but, a different route? Okay. I Aubrey think, Plaza's butt smacked by John Voight. Sorry. I think... <laughs> 
<laughs> nice. Uh, I think a better choice for me personally, because I, I love Synecdoche in New York, don't get me wrong, but I think for me a, a film that is more autobiographical doesn't make sense. Maybe going right hook and a movie that its major theme isn't necessarily about the creative process, but towards the end of the film definitely has motifs towards that. You might not see this one coming, but The Boy and the Heron is, mm. I think, maybe yeah. my double feature pick for this film. I think that uh, similar, uh, Miyazaki took 10 years to make this movie, uh, and that is a medium rare steak. Boy and the Heron is a fucking medium rare steak. It is perfectly cooked. Where yeah. Megalopolis is a little bit well done, and some people like well done, but it's not for me. So yeah, Boy and the Heron is my my pick. I like that. It's like you know you go into the dreamscape world you, that you, you didn't can't see that one coming. To others, what it is like. Uh, no, I I think I think those make a lot of sense. I've, I'm going to you know once you're done showering. Uh, maybe you can go see Metropolis from 1927. I don't know where you'd find it. You'd probably have to get a physical copy of it. But um, I, I, I wouldn't mind if just like, you know, if, if Megalopolis just goes lost. <laughs> I don't know if we need to preserve it. That's harsh. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm, so, I'm really sorry. I, I, think, I think he's done with filmmaking and it's fine. Uh, just, just move to Rome or something and enjoy it. It's like, oh, I can see the difference. I can see the future in Rome. Uh, anyways, there's a couple of new releases that come out uh, this week. Uh, namely, the big, the big one on, on October 4th. We are getting the sequel to Joker, Joker Folia de. We'll talk about that more in spoiler fashion detail next week. You can already find the review uh, on the channel, probably clipped from our recap, but also in a recap, Kevin and I talked about it. I didn't like it as much. He did, uh, but we'll get into that a bit more next week. Then White Bird, uh, a Wonder story. Um, it was a movie, this novel adaptation of uh, Wonder. I actually read the book as well a couple of years back. Is getting a, I don't know, spin-off sequel prequel i don't know i don't know about it oh my god that's it looks so depressing once you like go from the bright light to the like the darkness there like on uh but yeah no there's also dali oh it's actually dali that's coming out uh uh in limited release in the states uh we caught this one at last year's venice and had a quite good time of it with this quinton uh dupieux film then the outrun with sasha ronan is going into limited release and then Saturday night is also probably a lot of these limited releases are like super limited release. Like it might only be New York and LA, uh, but over the next couple of weeks, you can expect to uh, for them to get a bigger run. And then also the 50th anniversary of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre sees a rerun of that film back in theaters. Then out on a VOD, we got uh, The Legend of Vox Machina over on Prime. I just saw this morning that... Prime Video is releasing the entirety of season one and two on their YouTube channel. So if you want to see it for free and you don't have Prime, um, yeah, maybe just watch it and see if you want to check out season three. Then the platform too, uh, the Portuguese film, I think, or uh, I don't know. I'll correct it in the edit if that's wrong, is heading over to Netflix. The Rings of Power season two is concluding. I haven't seen a single episode of season two yet, but... I might make time for it this week. The franchise, the series, um, is releasing over on HBO Max. Then Deadpool and Wolverine is coming out on Premium VOD. Evil Does Not Exist is over on the Criterion channel. Strange Darling hits VOD and Speak No Evil Premium VOD. That's the remake version. The other one's out for at least two years now. Then Hold Your Breath is out on Hulu. That's about a young mother in 1930s Oklahoma who is haunted by a past trapped in horrifying dust storms. Sounds intriguing to me. Uh, House of Spoils is over on Prime, starring Ariana DeBose, uh, DeBose and Barbie Ferreira. Uh, we also got Salem's Lot on Max. It's What Inside, uh, a Netflix uh, horror film that premiered at Sundance in South by Southwest, I think. Had me super intrigued. I'm looking forward to this one. The Killers Game comes out on Premium VOD, and then VHS Beyond is out on Shutter and AMC+. Plus. The 10th 
entry into this franchise. I've only seen a couple of them. Uh, they're very hit or miss uh, anthology stories within that franchise. Uh, but hey, it might be uh, your jam. Then over in Australia, I can recommend you I, the Executioner. Actually, a pretty fun uh, action film that I got to see in Gun early this year as well. And then, uh, like I said at the start of the show, Akira Kurosawa has a bunch of 4K restoration screenings happening there from Seven Samurai to Redbird to High and Low uh, to a bunch of others. Uh, but yeah, go go give those a try. It might be the only opportunity to see a crisp 4K version of it on the big screen. And then in Switzerland, uh, obviously we get the start of the Zurich Film Festival, but also the release of The Wild Robot uh, is this week. And we might talk about that one as it is looking like a uh, big contender for that best animation Oscar. Um, but yeah, that's it for this week. Uh, Lachlan, Megalopolis, Megaflop. I, I, do you agree, Megaflopolis? Can, can you call it Megaflopolis? No. no, no. Because no, I, I still guess. appreciate uh, the artist. And I feel like that I is will remain really, the hater. Really the mean. Uh, but do you like, know, did you like a, this? Did you, did you enjoy this? Uh, this was a funny bit. Was this, in... was this a good bit? This is like, okay, so this is a perfect setup for next week's movie because it's like on the inside, Joker is really haunted, you know, as a person. But on the outside, he puts out this persona of like, I'm the Joker, but Arthur Fleck inside is drinking and sad and depressed. And that's what this feels like, you know, once you put down the facade of your green screen, it's all all darkness. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We'll, we'll we'll talk to you next week. A Joker Folia Adieu, a Joker 2. If you can't say Folia Adieu, uh that's fine. You're just American. That's fine. We forgive you. Goodbye. I couldn't even say Tar Tarkovsky <laughs> earlier. And now you want to make fun of other people. Folia Adieu. Uh, well, Kevin makes fun of me. It's all the vicious circle of like, you know, perpetuated hatred. Welcome oh, back like to the Quiet On Set part. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just jumped straight in before giving you a warning. I thought I'd just what? point out like the, the movies I've put in the background just to flare up. La Chimera, Everything. that's Blade Runner 2049, that's Godzilla and Dune Part 2. What's the one so on the La bottom? So La Chimera, right? that's Princess Mononoke. Okay. Oh, and that's oh. Dune. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It, and then. Yeah, I thought that the uh, one at the bottom might be like a Godzilla thing. <laughs> Morpheus, and then the the ah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. The and then collection. the box set of Ghibli yeah 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 sorry I like it I like had to, it had to spice up no so yeah no I I mean I, I I honestly was like looking at the background and maybe the change of it I was like oh that's color that must be green screen. Ooh. <laughs>